Hello, this is a reporting about work, study, and measurement, specifically Chapter 5, which is Workplace Equipment and Tool Design. Its primary ob objectives is to fit the workplace to the operator, provide adjustability, maintain neutral postures such as joints in mid-range, minimize repetitions, use power grips when force is required, and use pinch grips for precision and not force. The topic outlined for Chapter 5, Part 1, which is Anthropometry and Design, are Design for ex Extremes, Design for Adjustability, Design for Average, and lastly is Practical Considerations. In Part 1, Anthropometry and Design, the primary guideline is to design the workplace to accommodate most individuals with regard to structural size of the human body. Anthropometry Rooted, is rooted from the word anthros or anthropos, which means man and human, and meter, which means to measure. Uh, anthropometry is the science of measuring the human body and is termed anthropometry and typically utilizes a variety of cal caliper-like devices to measure structural dimensions, examples of which are stature and forearm length. Practically speaking, however, Few ergonomists and engineers collect their own data because of the wealth of data that has already been collected and tabulated close to 1,000 different body dimensions and for close to 100 mostly military population types are available in somewhat dated anthropometric source book which is according to Web Associates in 1978. More recently, the CSER or is an abbreviation for Civilian, American, and European Surface Anthropometry Resource Project collected over 100 dimensions on 5,000 civilians using three-dimensional body scans. A summary of useful dimensions that apply to the particular postures needed for workplace design for U.S. males and females given in this table. And these are the selected body dimension lists. The use of this selected body dimension list is to know the standard uh, of the positioning of the joints to maintain neutral postures. Much of this anthropometric data is included in computerized human models such as CombiMan, Jack, Mannequin Pro, and SafeWorks that are that provide easy size adjustments and limitations in ranges of motion or visibility as part of the computer-aided process. This is a selected body dimensions and weights of U.S. adult civilians, listed 16, where X is equals to the weight, and that is based from the selected body dimension list, or this diagram shown. These parts were actually surveyed and were taken off from a specific population and was and was measured to gain an average of the 5th percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 95th percentile. But the goal here is to know the minimum, which is the 5th percentile, and the maximum, 95th percentile, of a the st stature or postures, body dimensions that are observed in a specific population. Now, shown is a standard normal distribution of male weight, where the 5th percentile or the negative Z score is at the left side and the positive Z score or the 95th percentile is at the right side. Z score or standard curve technically measures how many standard deviations below or above the population mean a raw score is. An example is as shown. A kth percentile is defined as a value such as k percent of the data values or plotted in ascending order are at or below this value and 100 minus k percent of the value are at or above this value. Instagram plot of U.S. adult male statures show that bell-shaped curve 
termed as normal distribution within a median value of 68.3, which is shown earlier in the figure or table 5.1, this is also the 50th percentile value. For example, one half of all males are shorter than 68.3, while one half are taller. The fifth percentile male is only 63.7 in tall, while a 95th percentile male is 72.6 in tall. The proof is as follows. Typically, in a statistical approach, the approximately bell-shaped curve is normalized by the transformation given below. Z is equals to quantity of x minus the Greek symbol mu. Typically, in a statistical approach, the approximately bell-shaped curve is normalized by the transformation given below. Z is equals to the quantity of x minus the Greek symbol mu all over delta, where mu means the mean and the delta means standard deviation or the measure of dispersion. Now, to form a standard normal distribution, once normalized, any approximately bell-shaped population distribution will have the same statistical properties. This, will, this allows easy calculation of any percentile value desired using the appropriate k and z values as follows. So, in the kth percentile, when you're using the 10th or the 90th percentile, your z value would be positive negative 1.28. When your kth percentile is at 5 or the 5th percentile or 95th percentile, the z value is positive negative 1 plus 6, 1.645. If the percentile is 2.5th or 97.5th percentile, the z value would be positive negative 1.96. And lastly, if your percentile would be 1 th or 99th z value would be positive negative 2.33 now given that the measure stature for males in the u.s is 68.3 and that is according to this table in the stature the 50th percentile the 5th percentile and the 95th percentile while the standard deviation is 2.71 given or 6.9 cm according to web associates in 1978 the 95th percentile male stature is calculated as 68.3 which is our 50th percentile of the male stature plus the 1.645 z score or the z value times 2.71 which is the given standard deviation and it is equals to 72.76 inch which is close to our table in the stature 95th percentile which is 72.6 while the fifth percentile male stature is 68.3 the fifth uh, according to the fifth percentile minus 1.645 times 2.71 which is the standard deviation given and it is equals to 63.84 which is closely relative to our table in the stature height in the fifth percentile which is 63.7 now we're going to look at the normal distribution curve which is below this now as you can see the figure below is closely related or identical to the standard normal distribution of male weight shaded area of the left side is 5% as well as the right side and the left side is the 5th percentile while the right side is the 95th percentile and note that the calculated values of 72.76 and 63.84 are not exactly equal to the actual values in the table, which is 72.6 and 63.7 inches. 
This is also because the U.S. mail height distribution is not a completely normal distribution. Design for extremists. Designing for most individual is an approach that involves the use of one of three different specific design principles as determined by the type of design problem. Design for extremists implies that a specific design feature is a limiting factor in determining either the maximum or minimum value of a population variable that will be accommodated. For example, clearances such as a doorway or entry open, opening into a storage tank should be designed for the maximum individual, that is, a 95 percentile male stature or shoulder width. The 95 percent of all males and all most females will be able to enter the opening. Obviously, for doorways, space is usually not at a premium, and the opening can be designed to accommodate even larger individuals. On the other hand, added space in military aircraft or submarines is expensive, and these areas are therefore designed to accommodate only a certain or smaller range of individuals. Reaches for such things as a brake pedal or control knob are designed for the minimum individual. That is a 5 percentile female leg, leg or arm length. The 95% of all females and practically all males will have a longer reach and will be able to activate the pedal or control. Next up is design for adjustability. So it is typically used for equipment or facilities that can be adjusted to fit a wider range of individuals. It also ensures the workstation fits the worker and it recognizes uniqueness to every worker or employee to meet their individual needs. And designing for adjustability is the preferred method of design, but since it is um, uh, adjustable, so it is quite um, expensive for the implementation of it. So example would be chairs, table, desk, vehicle seats, steering columns, and tool supports are devices that are typically adjusted to accommodate the worker population ranging from 5th percentile females to 95th percentile males. And um, another example for this one is the driver's seat car. So the height, position, tilt, angle, back support are all adjustable so that um, it can provide uh, comfort to the user. The next design would be the design for average. So unlike the uh, design for adjustability, design for average is the cheapest but least preferred approach. Even though there is no individual with all average dimensions, there are certain situations where it would be impractical or too costly to include adjustability for all features. So this design for average, um, their approach is like um, one size fits all solution. And the example for that one would be most industrial machine tools are too large and too heavy to include height adjustability for the operator. And another example for this one is your typical public transportation. If um, you're gonna take the bus or the jeep when you're gonna commute, as you can observe the seats are identical, same length, uh, same distance and all. And so average person doesn't exist. We all know that, that we are distinct from uh, one another, especially when it comes to uh, body dimensions. So it varies from person to person. And if, uh, designing for average can accommodate maybe 50% uh, of the users, but it is not optimal for everyone. Maybe um, it's okay to sit in an uncomfortable seat for 15 to 30 minutes when you're commuting. But when it comes to industrial workplace or environment, it is really vital to, um, to be comfortable. And um, because a fixed workstation would cause repetitive stress to the employee or the worker uh, if they're working uh, every day. 
So the last part of our report is the practical considerations. Due to the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, reasonable effort must be made to accommodate individuals with all abilities. So the special accessibility guidelines have been issued by Department of Justice of 1991 regarding of the parking lots, interways into buildings, assembly areas, hallways, ramps, elevator, door, lavatories, restaurant or cafeteria facilities, alarm and telephones. And it is also very useful if practical and cost effective since to build of a full mock-up sa equipment being designed and then have the users evaluate the mock-up. Anthropometric measurements are typically made in standardized posture. In real life, people slouch or have relaxed postures, changing the effective dimensions and the ultimate designs. An example in 5.2, 5, 5 the final design should accommodate more than 95% of the population so that the er makalesa errors during production and the true design should have used body dimensions for a combined sa male and female population. However, the combi combination data are rarely available but the data can still be created through stati statistical techniques. I'm here to discuss the part two, which is the principles of work design, the workplace. The first lesson would be determine work surface height by elbow height. The work surface height should be determined by a comfortable working posture for the operator. Typically, this means that the upper arms are hanging down naturally and the elbows are flexed at 90 degrees so that the forearms are parallel to the ground. In figure 5.4, we can see that the upper arms are hanging down while the elbows are flexed at 90 degrees so that the forearms are parallel to the ground. The elbow height becomes the proper operation or work surface height. If the surface is too high, the upper arms are abducted, leading to shoulder fatigue. If the surface is too low, the neck or back is flexed forward, leading to back fatigue. It is important to have a good posture in doing your work so that you will not encounter any problems while doing it. For the second lesson, adjust the work surface height based on the task being performed. This means that your work surface height will be basing on the task that you are doing. For rough assembly involving, involving the lifting of heavy parts, it is more advantageous to lower the work surface by as much as 8 inches or 20 centimeters to take advantage of the stronger trunk muscles. For fine assembly in involving minute visual details, it is more advantageous to raise the work surface by up to 8 inches or 20 centimeters to bring the details closer to the optimum line size line of sight of 15 degrees. Another, perhaps better, alternative is to slant the work surface approximately 15 degrees, then both principles can be satisfied. However, rounded parts then have a tendency to roll off the surface. So in here, we can see that when you lift a heavy object, they need to lower the work surface as much as eight inches so that they can take advantage of the trunk muscles. Then, when they are involving minute visual details, it is advantageous to raise the work surface by up to 8 inches, so they need to raise it up and bring the details closer to the optimum line sight of 15 degrees. So we can see here that the line sight of the person in the picture is at 15 degrees angle. These principles also apply to a seated workstation. A majority of tasks, such as writing or light assembly, are best performed at the resting elbow height. If the job requires the perception of line detail, it may be necessary to raise the work to bring it closer to the eyes. So basically, the most important thing is the operator is comfortable in 
his or her position while doing the work so that they can perform the work better and have no problems while doing the task. Seated workstations should be provided with adjustable chairs and adjustable footrest. So we can see here that the chairs can be adjustable and the footrest as well because it will depend on the height also of the operator on how he or she can grab the things that he or she is working on. Then we need to adjust it to make them comfortable in doing their task. Ideally, after the operator is comfortably seated with both feet on the floor, the work surface is positioned at the appropriate elbow height to accommodate the operation. Thus, the workstation also needs to be adjustable. Short operators whose feet do not reach the floor, even after adjusting the chair, should utilize a footrest to provide support for the feet. So that's what I'm telling you about a while ago, that it also depends on the height of the worker. If they cannot reach the floor, we need to use a footrest so that they have a support for their feet. And I'm going to present to you the 5.2.3. And this is all about provide a comfortable chair for the seated operator. So first of all, before we're going to start, uh, I just want to um, explain about sitting. So sitting, there's actually sitting postures are actually very important because it improves blood flow it helps clean your nerves and blood vessels and it supports your muscles ligaments and tendons especially to those people who are actually working in the operation and right now we're, let's go to the next slide and this is the seated posture is important from the standpoint of reducing both the stress on the feet and the overall energy expenditure because comfort is a very individual response strict principles for good seating are somewhat difficult to define so as what i have discussed a while ago sir so this is all about being comfortable while you are working so it's very important since most of us when you can you're going to go to the operation sites you could see the workers or operators sitting and i do believe that sitting posters or how comfortable they are when they work it's very essential to their health and to their bodies and furthermore few chairs will comfortably adapt to the many possible seating postures so right now here let's have a look here in the figure 5.7 so this is the six basic seating posters and the first one is the front support so you could see there that there's actually a frontal here so that's why it's called front support because it actually supports um, your front um, body while you are working and next would be the reclining so it's it is obvious here that the operate the operator is actually reclining so he or she is reclining on the chair and the next is the kneeling part so in this part the, the operator is also kneeling like you can you can see on his knee and the next one is the rebalance so it is actually a seating posture where you can balance or you can rebalance and the next one would be the stool so it's like sitting sitting on a stool so this is actually the posture of it and the last one would be tra traditional so traditional is the most common one since um we uh kind of most of us kind of sit like this and now let's have the next one here so however several general principles hold true for all seats when a person is standing erect the lumbar portion of the spine curves naturally inward which is termed lordosis so however as a person sits down the pelvis rotates backward flattening the lordotic curve and increasing the pressure on the, this in the vertebral column so therefore it is very important to provide lumbar support in the form of an upward bulge in the seat back 
or even a simple lumbar pad placed at the belt level. So in this spot here, so lumbar supports actually maintain a natural cur curvature without lower back support. So overall, it actually supports um, our lumbar part of our body. And it is it is actually uh, put like chairs, existing chairs, like for example, like um, on the chairs there, sir, so it, it can support the lumbar. And right here, let's take a look on the figure 5.8. And this is the posture of the spine when standing and sitting. So lumbar portion of spine is lordotic when standing. So that is this one, the letter A. And this is kyphotic when sitting. And this is the letter B. So the shaded vertebrae are the lumbar portion of the spine. And here, let's have another approach to preventing flattening of the lordotic curve is to reduce the pelvic rotation by maintaining a large angle between the torso and thighs. And you can see that one here again on the kneeling posture here on the six basic seating posture. So this is actually a good position for preventing flattening of the lordotic curve. And this theory is that this is a shape maintained by astronauts in the weightless environment of space. So this is the one. It's actually um, like a representation of the theory about um, how we can maintain our shape in the weightless environment of space. So this one here. And furthermore, the this, however, the disadvantage of this type of seat is that it may put additional stress on the knees. So as we all know, it's like kneeling. So it would actually really put pressure. The addition of a pommel to the forward sloping seat, forming a saddle-like seat, may be a better overall approach as it as it eliminates the need for knee supports and still allows for back support. And now here, so this is actually an example of a saddle chair. So saddle chair is actually, it's actually used the same principles in its design as an equestrian saddle. So in this part here, this is the version of a saddle chair and it actually improves leg circulation and reduces fatigue. So as an ESL teacher, I have like this kind of chair and I usually use this when teaching in the office and it actually makes me more comfortable and not so much pressure on my back. And now this is also the designing seating in a large training room. So in this spot here, this example will show the step-by-step -step procedures utilized in a typical design problem. And number one is determining the body dimensions critical to the design, such as sitting height, erect, and high height sitting. Number two would be define the population being served. So U.S. adult males and females, it, de it depends on the population that you have chosen. And next would be the number three, select a design principle and the percentage of the population to be accommodated. Number four would be find appropriate anthropometric values from table 5.1. And number five would be add allowances and test. So this is actually a seating design in a large training room. And now let's have the next one here. This is the recommended seat adjustments on table 5.2. So you can see here that this um, these are the seat parameter here. So seat height, seat depth, seat width, and so on. And these are the design value in centimeter. And for example, let's have the seat height number letter A, and it actually has 16 to 20.5 and the comments would be here so it would be too high compresses thighs too low and this pressure increases and that would be so on and i think that would be all here sir for the 5.2.3 this is all about provide a comfortable chair for the seated operator next is 5.2.4 provide adjustability in the seat adjustability for specific seat parameters Seat height is most critical, with ideal height being determined by the person's biblical height, which is defined in the figure below. As you can see in the figure below, 
popliteal height is the distance from the underside of the foot to the underside of the thigh at the knees. Table 5.1 shows selected body dimensions and weights. And weights. In this table, you can see body dimension, the sex or the gender, the dimension in inch and the dimension in centimeter. For example, eyesight. For the male, it's 59.5 inch and for the female, it's 54.4 inch. Acid that is too high will uncomfortably compress the underside of the thighs. Acid that is too low will raise the knees uncomfortably high and decrease trunk angle. Again, increasing this pressure. So it must be that the chair is adjustable so that the operator, may it be tall or short, can sit comfortably. Specific recommendations for seat height and other seat parameters are given in the table 5.2. Table 5.2 rec shows recommended seat adjustment range, ranges in which you can see seat parameter, design value in inch or centimeter unless specified and the comments. In addition, armrest for shoulder and arm support and footrest for shorter individuals are recommended. Casters assist in movement and ingress which is going or entering, or egress, which is going out or leaving from the workstation. However, there may be situations where a stationary chair is desired. An overall optimum working posture and workstation is shown in the figure 5.10. Figure 5.10 shows properly adjusted workstation for the arms, backrest, posture, desk, telephone, screen, keyboard, document holder, seat, feet, and avoid the, avoiding eye strain. So the next is 5.2.5, encourage postural flexibility. It is important to encourage postural flexibility in the workplace. The workstation height should be adjustable so that the work can be performed efficiently, either standing or sitting. Because our human body is not designed for a long period of sitting or standing. If you sit in a long period of time, we may feel some back pain. Or if we stand in a long period of time, we will surely have cramps and muscle pain. Because the disc between the vertebrae do not have separate blood supply. And they rely on the pressure changes resulting from movement to receive nutrients and remove waste. And Postural rigidity also reduces blood to the muscle and induces muscle fatigue and cramping. That's why an alternate compromise is to provide a seat stand stool. So what is seat stand stool? So seat stand stool are chairs and stools allow you to shift your weight and rest periodically while standing. So you can stand longer. Perch seating is great blend between sitting and standing for you to have some support while standing without being in a fully seated position. So there are two key features for a seat or stand stools are height adjustability and a large base of support so that the stool does not tip preferably long enough that the feet can rest on and counterbalance. So here we can see in the figure 5.11, the industrial seat or stand stools. So the Seat stand stool are height adjustability, so we can adjust its height to the preferred length that we desire. Provide anti-fatigue mats for standing operator. So what is anti-fatigue mats? Are mats designed to reduce fatigue costs by standing for long periods on a hard surface? Example, cement floor. So anti-fatigue mats are often used to decrease foot and lower limb disorders for workers who stand in one position for long periods of time. Standing for extended periods in a cement floor is fatiguing. When we say fatigue, something such as tiring efforts or activity that causes tiredness or weariness, the operators should be provided with resilient anti-fatigue mats. The mats allow small muscle contraction in legs, forcing the blood to move and keeping it from tending to pull in the lower extremities. Let's talk about locating all tools and materials within the normal working area. In every motion, a distance is involved. The greater the distance, the larger the muscular effort, control, and time. So, it is therefore 
important to minimize distances. Positioning of our body and equipment in a workplace is very important so that the worker can do work comfortably. Arms. When an operator hands are on keyboard, upper arm and forearm should form right angle. Backrest. Adjustable for occasional variations. Shape should match contour of lower back, providing even pressure and support. Posture. Sit all the way back into chair for proper back support. Neck should be comfortably erect. Knees should be slightly lower than hips. Desk. Thin work surface to allow legroom and posture adjustments. Adjustable surface height preferable. Table should be large enough for books, files, telephones, while permitting different position of screen, skateboard, and mouse pad. Telephone. Cradling telephone receiver between head and shoulder can cause muscle strain. Headsets allow head, neck to remain straight while keeping hands free. Document holder. Same height and distance from user as the screen, so eyes can remain focused as they look from one to another. Screen. Position so that mid-screen is 150 down from eye level. Keyboard. Position to allow hands, forearms to remain straight, level. Seat. Adjustable height. Angle firm cushion. Waterfall front helps circulation to legs. Feet. Entire sole should dress comfortably on floor or footrest. Here are the tips to avoid eye strain. Number 1. Get glasses that improve focus on screen. Measure distance before visiting eye doctor. Number 2. Try to position screen or lamps so that the lightning is indirect. Do not shining directly at screen or into eyes. Number 3. Use a glare reducing screen. Number 4. Periodically rest eyes by looking into the distance. The normal working area in the horizontal plane of the right hand includes the area circumscribed by the arm below the elbow when it's moved in an arc pivoted at the elbow. This area represents the most convenient zone within which mot motions may be made by that hand with the normal expenditure of energy. The normal area of the left hand may be similarly established since movements are made in a third dimension as well as in a horizontal plane. The normal working area also implies to the vertical plane. Generally speaking, all work, work materials and equipments should be in the range of the worker so that the worker can work comfortably in a working area. Next is fixed location for all tools and materials to permit the best sequence. So in driving an automobile, we are all familiar with the short time required to apply the foot brake. So the reason is very obvious since the brake pedal is fixed, cut iron, no time is required to decide where the brake is located. So the body responds extensively and applies pressure to the area where all driver knows the foot pedal is located. So if the location of the brake foot pedal varied, the driver would need considerably more time to brake the car. Similarly, provide fixed location for all tools and materials at the workstation eliminates or at least minimizes the short hesitations required to search for the select the objects needed to, the, to do the work. So for the next topic, Use gravity beans and drop delivery to reduce reach and move times. So gravity beans are components that can be continuously brought to the normal work area. Thus it will eliminate long reaches to get supplies. So for basically gravity beans are the containers which provide the workers all the supply he needed. Likewise, gravity shoes allows the disposal of completed parts within the normal work area, eliminating the long movement to do so. So gravity shoes make cleans make clean work area possible as finished material is carried away from the 
work area rather than stack up all around it so basically gravity shoots are the carrier which carried away the materials going uh, I mean the finished materials going to the stack room or the storage area so these are the this is the example of a workstation utilizing gravity beans and built conveyor to reduce reach and move time so as we can all see the, it has a four uh, I mean five gravity beans in front of him which being organized and filled with his all his supplies needed to to create a cert uh I mean to assemble a certain product then at the back portion it has a belt conveyor which in which he will put his finished materials and the belt conveyor will transport the finished materials going to the um, stock area so to further so these are some examples of gravity beans and examples of gravity chutes arrange tools controls and other components optimally to minimize motion optimum arrangements allow users to access and use components easily and smoothly the optimum arrangement depends on many characteristics both human their strength reach sensor and task the loads repetition orientation obviously not all factors can be optimized careless arrangement can cause confusion and make things more difficult the designer must set priorities and make trade-offs in the layout of the workplace this figure shows the tool balancers provide fixed location for tools however certain basic principles should be followed first the designer must consider the general location of components relative to other components using the importance and frequency of use principles so these are the principles of display layout the importance principle components most crucial to achievement of system goals should be located in convenient locations the frequency of use principle components used more frequently should be placed in most convenient locations most frequently used displays should be positioned in the primary viewing area the most important as determined by overall goals or objectives or most frequently used components should be placed in the most convenient locations for example an emergency stop button should be placed in a readily visible reachable or convenient position similarly a regularly used activation button or the most often used fasteners should be within easy reach of the operator once the general location has been determined for a group of components that is the most frequently used parts for assembly the principles of functionality and sequence of use must be considered the sequence of use principle components which are used in sequence should be located next to each other and layout should reflect sequence of operation the functional grouping principle refers to the grouping of components by similar function for example all fasteners in one area all gaskets and rubber components in another area since many products are assembled in a strict sequence cycle after cycle it is very important to place the components or sub assemblies in the order that they are assembled since this will have a very large effect on reducing wasteful motions this figure shows a workstation utilizing gravity beans and a belt conveyor to reduce reach and move times. 
The conveyor in the background carries other parts past this particular workstation. The operator is feeding the conveyor from under the platform by merely dropping a symbol parts onto the feeder belt. The designer should also consider using Mothers systematic layout planning or other types of adjacency layout diagramming techniques to develop a quantitative or relative comparison of the various layouts components on a work surface. So, a systematic layout planning is a tool used to arrange a workplace in a plant by locating areas with high frequency and logical relationships close to each other. The relationships between components can be modified from traditional data on the flow from one area to another and should include visual links, eye movements, auditory links or voice communication or signals and tactile and control motions. So this is an example of motor systematic layout planning. These principles of work design for workstations are summarized in the workstation evaluation checklist. The analyst may find this useful in evaluating existing workstations or implementing new workstations.